All right, so yeah, soft reset is just pulling back, letting all your resources get back up, and then going back in. Uh, a soft reset can also be used when you have control of a point, you lose a team member, uh, but you still have map control. So map control is space control. Um, for example, on Ilios, if we're let's get an angle here that's awkward so ilios say you're playing <coughs> out in the like your tanks are pushed up this way and they're coming from here is um, there a way you can like exit out the more videos thing or is that me i don't know i think that's me too wait what more videos i don't even see that Oh, I can't You're get rid of it. Dude, I don't fucking see it. Okay, so thanks on drugs again. Let me... Drugs, because there is not a thing like that for... I will send you a picture. No, I don't, do think, I, I don't, I don't think I can do anything about it right now. Okay, um, that's whatever. Alright, so... Yeah, say you have control of the point. You're pushing up aggressively, and you lose your Lucio out here while they're pushing in. Or in the hallway over here. An ideal soft reset here is everybody pushing back as soon as possible, either holding the backside of the point right here or falling back into the mega room. You can let them go all the way up till the last little tick and then come back with speed boost. So that's a very specific situation I'm describing, but like in any situation, if you lose somebody that can make it back, you can soft reset to point or even if they can make it back, you can soft reset to point in order to prolong the fight. Because if you keep fighting up here and you've lost one of your integral pieces, you're not going to last as long as if you turtled on point behind a Rhine shield. So, a uh, soft reset can benefit in that way too, where you just like, you, uh, because of advantageous map control, a soft reset can either save a team fight or prolong a team fight past its past where it normally would have ended uh, in their favor. Um, what else? So I want to put a text box of all the shit we're going over. So this needs to be black. Soft reset. Uh, um, kite. What does it mean to kite something? Uh, it's a bait question. Anybody else? <laughs> Obviously wrong. Never use kite, so just go ahead. Uh, so kite you'll hear from coaches and like, I, I hear Jane use it a lot on his streams. When you kite something, you're just falling back. Like, they use beat, kite the beat. Wait for it to expire, then re-engage. Uh... They use a Moira ult to try to push in. Kite the, kite the ult, just fall back. So it's a uh, different word for waiting it out. Just a short yeah. one, basically. Oh, okay. But yeah. it's also a positional term in that you are falling back. So yeah. it's like a quick soft reset in the way of... Yeah, exactly. You your soft reset position, but as soon as that ultimate's over, then you go back in. Yeah, so like they Dragon Blade, but you're goat. Kite the Dragon Blade, punish him. Got you. Um, yeah, so that's kiting. Peeling. Um, Help your backline. Help. Don't Help you whoever needs it. Yeah, Help. It's not just Help your backline. Yeah. So, gen so, what are the two most popular peel characters that we see played? Uh, Brig. Brig is the Lucio. first. Lucio. Lucio. Lucio can be a peel character. I look at D.Va as more of a hardcore D peel character. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I agree. So, Brig and D.Va are traditionally the anti flanker peel characters. And peel generally will be referring to a flanker because uh, you're taking, you're shifting attention from the front of the fight to a peel target. In this scenario, we'll use a Tracer or Genji. So, um,. Say your supports are playing this backside right here, and an enemy Genji or Tracer makes their way around this way. 
Um, as a tank fighting on the front line, which is here, your immediate responsibility and your diva is probably the one that's right here. So your diva has to have cooldowns available and go straight to your supports. Um, peeling doesn't always mean fully committing to the threat. Uh, that's a mistake I see made a lot is we'll, uh, we'll see like uh, me on Wrecking Ball or somebody playing D.Va will come back and try to deal with a flanker and then chase that flanker down and try to kill that flanker. Sometimes all you got to do is just scare them off. So peel doesn't necessitate uh, tunnel vision and frag. It's just peel and help your supports and get the pressure off of them. Um, other terms, other terms. Um, does peeling also getting dove? Uh, so peel, you have to peel a dive. Uh, if it is a true coordinated dive, peeling a dive will require more than just your diva flying back. You're going to need a brig. You're going to need probably like an, uh, an ananade or something. It's going to be a team effort to peel for that full team dive. Um, in scrim games, we, especially at our ELO, we're not going to see a lot of that coordinated dive. Even like, you don't even see it at Diamond and Masters a lot. The, the kind of discipline that you need to pull off the the staging phase and then the oh that's another thing to go over staging and then the um engage is it's really tricky to pull off in even like in a proper team much less a scrim team um but yeah peeling does refer to what's done for a dive or like countering a dive is peeling the dive uh so next is staging who wants to guess what staging is? Uh, prep for a team fight, upcoming team fight, get into positional uh, rotation, I don't know, something like that. But More I'm or guessing less. it's that period where you like just poke each other trying to get your ult, trying to so, no, that, get a pick. <laughs> that is, I would call that the poke phase. This staging specifically refers to dive comps. And when you're staging a dive, you're putting your uh you're putting your tanks in position to where they can engage with minimal cooldown investment so for instance if you're playing dive defense or if you have control of the point and you're playing defense you're gonna put a diva and even maybe a genji up here you're gonna put something up here you're gonna have something threatening them here and then your support's on point so this is staging a dive if at the start of a fight you're not already in these positions it becomes immensely harder to actually engage much less get a valuable engage with a dive comp so staging a dive is all about putting yourself in a position where you can engage on the enemy without investing a lot of cooldowns um the same as setup right yeah um <laughs> So, in this situation, a team pushing in here will have to deal with a Tesla cannon, zapping them from here, uh, D.Va rockets and Genji shurikens from here, potentially um, maybe a McCree or a Tracer on the ground here, some sort of threat, just like making it annoying for them to walk in. And all this pressure makes it so that their, their supports are safe. Now... Uh, going back to peeling, if we have if the tanks have to peel in this situation, all they got to do is use their cooldowns defensively rather than aggressively. So if you have a Winston on one, a Diva on the other, the the Winston notices that um, support needs help here. He jumps, bubbles, easy save. Diva does the same. Matrixes like. That's how you set up for either a offensive or a defensive peel. Or not peel, a stage. Um, what you were saying, Sheeps, is the poke phase. 
which dive comps don't have a poke phase. Which is why heroes like McCree and Hanzo don't really synergize well with di uh, dive is because they get their value during the poke phase. They build up value by putting out massive amounts of damage over a span of five to six seconds, just like... So you're picking on my mains. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but, like, you wouldn't want to play those as DPS in a dive comp because, like, it's inherently hard to achieve value versus having a Genji, which... A Genji pounces on the first dive target with his tanks, gets a reset immediately. Dashes into the next target, helps them kill that, resets immediately. So Genji creates a snowball effect within dive, and was the reason that the first dive comps actually started being played. Um, just because of the fact that dash reset can snowball fights that hard. Uh, Tracer compounded that by just being a DPS that can be everywhere, and potentially one-clip enemies. So having doomfist now farah as well having that burst dps in a dive comp is super threatening alongside the potential to just dive straight onto any target that's out of position or with uh without potential peel um when a target's called out of position it's usually because their allies have used cooldowns that makes it difficult for them to peel so um if we call ana no nade and now we see there's Zarya with no bubble out of position. That is a free kill. She's not going to get naded. We're not going to get naded. Going for her. But she's not going to get naded to be saved. So she could be 97 energy. She could be 50 energy. Whatever. Like That Zarya can be killed if she's out of position after her bubble expires. Uh, so those punishes are super important. Uh, and those are like split second happen uh instances that happen in each game that can be capitalized upon to swing an entire team fight and the entire game um shoot what did i want to go over next there's a couple other terms i slipped away for just a second did you go over dry run no i didn't that's a good one uh pathing is a good one pathing oh, what pathing oh uh, pathing yeah just the direction you're gonna go oh. it's something that can be decided going like leaving spawn but when it's not called can lead to an extremely disorganized team fight so uh leaving spawn here if you just call go left your your team fight becomes super clean if you don't call go left you get two teammates going here you get a couple <laughs> teammates going on the outside and then a couple teammates going left and it's really easy for the enemy to pick on you. So, pathing is a simple concept, but something that shouldn't go unaddressed. Uh, dry runs. Dry runs are Try really push, important. Right? Yeah. When you get fucked in the butt. So it's it, it's a weird concept because it feels like feeding. It kind of is feeding, but it's creative feeding. It's tactical. It's tactical feeding. Exactly. Yes, I like sir. it. Yes, <laughs> sir. So, say you have just won a team fight or lost a team fight, and you know that they have a big combo coming up. Like, their Genji hasn't bladed for two minutes, and their Zarya's been a higher energy for the last fight and a half. So, you're like, alright, this is coming. We don't have a Zen. We, we are going to lose to that when that happens. Don't commit alts. Don't, don't walk into that fight that you're going to lose knowing and uh, like knowingly committing alts and just throwing them away so in that situation we call for a dry run which is pushing fully committing to a fight but not using alts and the one with your ass cheeks spread and the beauty of a dry run is if they hold those alts if they play a little reserved your all-out aggression in that moment could just win you a fight without alts so dry runs can be super beneficial either to bait out enemy ults and save a lot of time that could otherwise be wasted or just to, um, <clears throat> whatchamacallit, what I just said. Words are hard. Um, Completely take over without using ults. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but generally dry runs are just a way to reset the ult economy and, and make, bring everything back to even. 
Uh, that's a good one. Alt economy. It's pretty easy. Just yeah, everyone in this Discord talks about that. Yeah, yeah it's huge, actually huge. What about alt tracking? Who takes care of that? Uh, how often do you, as an individual, track alts? All the time. I never do it. I always do it because I tend to play CC characters, and I always make men alt economy because I know I have the the, the resources to stop it and save. You know, like I play characters like Zen and Brig and McCree and you know people who have the power to stop alt. I, for me personally, I generally. So so while it can be very difficult tracking an entire team's ultimate economy by yourself. No. My like, favorite way to uh, handle things like is. Like I wouldn't I wouldn't track a bongo for example. Well, that's that's what I'm getting at. Is you should know everything the opposing team has available, but it's not your responsibility alone. As uh, as a main tank, Mew Mew, you're oh, yeah. on, you're only <laughs> at, after between every team fight, you should be asking yourself how close are they to shatter? Do they have shatter? All right. That's all you got to worry about. How many fire strikes have they hit? Uh, did they stop fire striking? Are they playing weird now? Do they, like, Ryans can telegraph their shatter. So, tracking your counterpart is the easiest way to track ults as a team. Because it's it's going to be impossible for one person to keep track of the opposing six people. So, it's definitely a team effort, and uh, it's always a good idea in between fights to ask your teammates. And to just have a quick spitball session of, like, wait, what ults do they have? What do they use? How close are they to these impactful ones? Um, uh, that knowledge and that communication between fights uh, can uh, prompt you to either have a dry fight and just like feed into them, or know that like, hey, they blew a trance last fight. We can do this super safely now. So okay. tracking alt economy or like knowing they don't have shatter. We can play a certain way. Our DPS are free to do this. Um, so yeah, just like um, alt economy uh, is very important in that sense. Uh, I think that's it for terminology, unless you guys can think of anything. Cozy boy, how about you? No, I think Actually, you guys are doing good so far. <laughs> I don't think I, I can't think of anything right offhand. If I think of anything, I'll bring it up. All right. So, do you want to do the structure of a team fight, or do you want to do shot calling and comp structure first? I say we do structure of team fight first, so we can talk about that a little bit more when we move into shot calling. All right. Sounds good. Um. So Honestly, they'll both feed off of each other, though. So whatever. Let's let's play a team fight up. Just because team fights can be sloppy, and sometimes don't even look like team fights. Oh, you're right. So let's see. I'm this, struggling. This is goats. So this is a really good indication of a like a proper team fight, but they never fully commit, so it's weird. All right. So we, as the goats comp, fully commit to point. Just plop ourselves on there. Uh, they they keep poking in and out, but they can't stay in because our presence is just too overwhelming there. So already we see the pathing coming into play because if we don't take the ideal path and speed boost to point, this Lucio coming in boops us all. So calling our pathing and calling our cooldown usage there on the speed boost saves us from a big counterplay potentially. Um <clears throat> So, I just want to, like, apply the terms here. Um, so, this is the beginning of the fight. Right now, we're scouting. Scouting it occurs at the start of the poke phase, which is what we're in at this point, even though we're goats and, like, poke doesn't apply to goats, even though it does. Um, it huh? No. Um, but right now, we're just trying to figure out what are we dealing with. We see the Junkrat, we see the McCree. We're like, alright, just huddle up oh. one point, 
force them into us, that's our win condition. Um, so, once the poke phase begins, uh, your tank's responsibility is to create space. Your main tank's responsibility is to create space. Your off tank's responsibility is to hold that space and deny it. So while Mew Mew's like charging in and like swinging her hammer, holding up her shield to create the initial space, my threat of 80 energy Desaria with big damage coming out, that's what holds the space in this particular comp. So, um, so that's what you should seek to achieve at the start of a poke phase and based on what happens over the next couple seconds you either soft reset or you hard engage so a soft reset in this situation would occur if they have a pharmacy plus a junk rat we're gonna be like all right hold back for a second once we get a bead on where we'd probably call the junk rat as our main target once we get a beat on where he's trying to play, we can dive that location. Actually, if they're running pharmacy I'm... here, no, they had a junk rat. They they did yeah yeah no I'm just saying like they they had a goats counter they didn't have all the goats counters so we were able to survive the one junk. Yeah, uh, pharmacy is a goats counter, right? Yeah, pharmacy yeah. uh, any ranged bulk da like uh explosive damage. Junkrat, Farah, Symmetra is a surprisingly song, strong goats counter because she's basically uh, Junkrat 2.0 now. She also takes away the focus of uh, like a certain person. Like if you have one person dedicated to dealing with turrets, they have to focus on the turrets rather than focusing on the team fight. So that takes mm. them kind of out of the fight for a little bit. Not Just necessarily. She's better at affording mobility to a team that doesn't have it. And holding space once it's been claimed through the use of the turrets. Because turning around and dealing with turrets is literally a 0.5 second play. It's not like that That minuscule amount of time created isn't worth noting in the grand scheme of things. Um, but anyways, we're, we're, uh, that's, that's more of a micro scale. Like situation but yeah uh to deal with a goats comp you want to play very slow with either a junkrat or a fara pocketed by a mercy and accumulate that ultimate go in off of it and make a play that way or the best way to deal with goats is play goats forehead yeah um, so they're, they're not playing a comp that's very well suited to dealing with us. If they had a Rhine Zarya up front, the DPS choices would be perfect and the healers would be perfect, but they take a long time to go to it. Um, that allows us to just stay in this poke phase perpetually. So we, we hardcore win if they just keep trying to poke like this. I farm their D.Va. Um, Ryan farms their monkey. We have way more healing than they could ever hope to have. We just outright win. So we never actually get into all the stages of the team fight here. We kind of just like s scare them off by being goats. Um, Bean picks Penny, and at that point, I think they start backing off. Why don't they start backing off? Uh, also, try and take note of like. Um... Everyone's ult percentage throughout the fight. Just look at McMean means as opposed to Kuriski's as well. Yeah, and that's a product of the comp, definitely. A lot of that is um, Bean's kind of poking around those doors where Kuriski isn't really able to do a whole lot because we have um, Ryan's shield, we have my shield, we have Tinsy eating stuff, we have him hitting Zarya bubbles, like... And he was just kind of hidden behind all of it. So he's not really hitting a whole lot where yeah. Bean's jumping around doing whatever the fuck he And the point I'm trying to get across with something like that is, like, be aware of how fast your, the enemy you're facing can build their ult. So if you ever do run into that kind of situation, it can help, with, like, with prior knowledge, like, make it easier to track their ults, like, knowing, hey, yeah, with this, they're going to get ult fast. 
Bastard. Like, hey, yes. they're running goats, and this fight's been going a while. They probably have beat. The I think that's what Tenzi is getting your house is like we can take from our experience of knowing like hey we get beat super fast playing goats that hey we're playing against goats and they're gonna have a beat because it's been a while. Um, so yeah, this this fight kind of just de devolves into they continue poking. We have point control. Um, let's see if we can get a clean team fight here. So they do go. F to the Rhine Zarya. Uh, Rhine Zarya Diva. So they're on Junkrat. Triple tank. Triple tank, yeah. Which is decent. It's not a bad... Moira Lucio. Yeah, Moira Lucio, if you're only running two healers, are the healers you want to run with this. So here, we don't want to take a poke battle. Because they do have the healing. They do have the... Um, the bodies and the health pools to take a longer fight. <laughs> So this is where we'll actually see a hard engage on our part. Where, actually they hard engage on us, but if they don't hard engage here, we have to hard engage. Um, so let's go over what a hard engage is. It's fully committing to a fight. So, uh, whether it's them just putting all their bodies onto the point, like they do here, or it's us realizing, hey, we're going to lose this fight to the Junkrat spam over time, we need to go in on them and get some picks and make a play. Um, we lose Niwu, so this fight turns sloppy. Um, the poke phase is over at this point. At this point, we're in the, what would I call it? Like the body of the fight? Mm -mm. The mid fight? I guess for comms purposes, we'll call it the mid fight because uh, that's what we call it with comms. <laughs> So we get into the mid fight where we start using ultimates. Uh, Niwu hits Mew with the uh, nano right before he dies. And then we all, we actually get hit. All five of us get hit with the beat. So that's ginormous. Um, they blow Coalescence and beat themselves. Although Icebreak didn't get beat. So... At that point, it's tricky going over this without going over comm structure. So I'm going to kind of throw some stuff in. At this point, we do want to like go to our mid-fight comms where... Um, at this point, it is Mew still calling because she's the one that sees the Rhine. But as soon as we realize, hey, they use beat, Rhine didn't get beat, focus the Rhine. Which I think we do. And Rhine dies right away. So yeah, Rhine dies. And we're still in the mid-fight here. I got uh, at this point, Niwu, what we want you to be doing as a spectator is calling 5v5, 4v5, 4v4, 4v3, 4v2 until you respawn. Uh, just giving our team a quick rundown of our advantage without having to look at the tab screen mid-fight can be super helpful. And knowing whether we can push an advantage or we need to play slow, play safe. Oh! Playing slow, another very good term that we need to go over. Uh, who wants to guess what playing slow is? Don't charge in. Very like, good example. Play defensively, we fall back. Play fall drag, fight. Basically drag, fight. Stay fall. alive. Playing slow is stay the fuck alive. Don't hit shift key. Don't hit shift with Reinhardt. Hit, hit, hit that S, S key. <laughs> Yeah, whether whether it's, whether it's whether it's taking cover, whether it's abandoning the one v one that you were about to take, it, playing slow, if your support calls for it, if your DPS calls for it, it's usually because you are either at a disadvantage, or you're very close to an important ultimate. So calling play slow, you don't want to take a pick. You, uh, it's either taking another pick or. Like taking an important loss in a 6v6 fight. So um, that play slow call, usually you want to use that when um, when you think your teammates are going to engage and they shouldn't. So rather than be like, no, don't go the fuck in, don't go in, don't go in. Like Rather than yelling at your tanks, like, come the fuck back to point, play slow, peel. Like... Three words can express a whole lot more than 
uh, cluttering the comms with uh, extra verbiage. Um, Alright, so we're in the mid fight here, and we do make the diva. At this point, we've lost Mew and Dink. So, with Mew being gone, uh, <coughs> either I have to or Bean has to take over the priority calls. Um, for, real quick, I know it's real basic, but focus fire is when we focus on a target. And priority is what needs to be focused first. So, if mid-fight, they surprise us with a Reaper near our backline, I'll save Reaper as priority. And even if we're engaged elsewhere, we need to, as a team, collectively focus that priority. So, like, it'll usually be like a Reaper, a Farah, some dangerous flanker that can swing a fight. We need to make that our priority mid-fight, even if we do have a couple picks, because they are so lethal if gone uncontested. Um, so yeah, uh, focus fire and priority are another two terms I wanted to address real quick. Um, so yeah, mid-fight, we, we have to decide at this point in a 4v4 situation if it's worth using ultimates or not. So... Uh, actually, it's a 3v4. It's me, Tinzi, and Bean. So, I'm at half health, but I have Brig Armor. And I'm not sure if Bean has cooldowns available or not. But at this point, I see the opportunity, and we get a 3-man grab? 4-man grab. 3-man grab. Which is... Oh, so it was a 3v3. It was a 3v3. It's 3v3. I think Penny... Penny had no. just responded. I think she jumped into the ground. Oh, yeah. No, Penny's Penny, grab. Penny got Jack's back. Jack's in grav. Chris using grav. It might have Volley been. Volley just killed Mew. I don't know where Volley's at. Volley backed up, I think. Volley's here, but not in grav. Oh, maybe it was a four-man and she... You go grab and she fades out. She fades out. Right. So it was a four-man. Sun, Tron. Wait, what? Is that the sun? I think the sun. Hmm? I think he's leaving. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's not in chat anymore with us. Oh, yeah. um. So yeah, at this point, we we have a three v four, but they're all squishies, and we have two tanks and a healer. So I make the call to grab them there. We capitalize on it, and it's a one team fight. So post fight, the so there's the the poke phase or the start of the fight. There's mid fight, and then there's post fight, and those are like the three stages of a fight, more or less. Post fight is where some of the most communication, uh, most important communication will occur. This is where the all tracking dialogue happens. This is where um, resource calls happen. Like Tinzi doesn't have mech. Don't hard engage until we get mech back. That type of stuff needs to be said here. Um, what else? Staggers can be called here if there's a potential stagger that we could follow on. This is uh, where we call for B taxi. Taxis, well. yeah, taxis are. I, I'm pretty sure, yeah, being being. He was already on it. We, didn't, yeah, we it didn't even have to call yeah, it. Yeah, he was on it. Yeah, yeah, he was on oh. it. Um, also, staging. If we're playing dive, this is where the staging is going to occur. This is where we burn the boosters and the dash and the uh, jump pack to get up to this high ground and start looking for our next dive. So uh, basically, for staging, we burn cooldowns post fight to have them for pre fight. Yeah, um, a kill box. That's something we didn't go over. Uh, when you're playing dive, there's certain places you don't want to fight. Around corners, anywhere near health packs, anything that can kind of stop the very limited damage sources you have, as Winston Diva, and maybe a Genji with you. So setting up a kill box is finding an area where it's going to be hard for them to retreat, where they are fully committed. So actually, that's not even the kill box here. It would be more like right here. Right outside of point. Yeah. So as soon as they've committed past this area, they've fully committed. They've hard engaged on us. And that's where 
we can jump on them, either jump straight on them or jump behind their back line and threaten their back line where their tanks have to come all the way back to contest us. So that's where staging comes in so important is you actually get to pick the perfect engagement. Okay, uh, so my question on that is we have what Diva and Genji say just example of dive like Diva Genji set up top maybe a Winston set up top so we're all set up top except for the supports you said earlier playing on point so, so if we dive behind their back line onto their back line then our supports are kind of fun. if our kill yeah if our kill box is going to be in this area supports will be off here somewhere away yeah like okay. off by our mega all they so need is sight lines. The they might, yeah, exactly. Depends where we want to fight them. The supports are going to position away from there. Um, um, that'll all be called like wind setting up, like wind staging, essentially. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so for here, for the a ideal staging, we'll have a diva right here. We'll have a Genji, or I think Genji goes right there because Winston can play right here, or right here, and get Cleave with his zap cannon as they approach through here or here without even having to drop so that's that's really big is just being that annoying presence and like usually if a team if a team's tanks are just walking in through here their back line is going to want to sit here for a second so winston staging right here he's getting all this fucking damage in on their supports without bubble being used, without jump pack being used. And now, oh, something's low over here. I can go fucking chase it. So, like, that's why conserving cooldowns and being disciplined on cooldown usage can be so important. Because yep. situations will present themselves where you're like, fuck, if I had boosters there, fuck, if I had matrix there. Because, like, I'm the worst, I'll burn matrix, like, Pre-fight, I'll burn my whole Matrix, and I'll be like, fuck, why am I just at a choke holding Matrix? I'm not Reinhardt. But then, like, suddenly they're using Tac Visor, and I'm like, shit, I only have, like, a quarter Matrix left. So, uh, resource con conservation comes into play in the mid, uh, in the pre-fight as well. Pre-fight, post-fight are kind of the same once the first fight happens. Um, although pre-fight, you do want to be calling opponents pathing. That can be one of the most important calls. Uh, flankers pathing is always important, uh, but uh, opponents pathing in the post fight or pre fight is very important. I think we did that really well on uh, Blizzard World in this. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but on that map they went the same way like every single fight. <laughs> yeah, but we, <laughs> but we, we still were called it. We, for, we did yeah, still call it. Moving. So like. Um. So as far as the structure of a team fight. I think that kind of covers that. If anybody wants to offer anything else, um, feel free. That's pretty solid. <coughs> All right, so let's go over comms and oh. comm shot calling and comm structure. Um, every team should have a designated shot caller. Having it as a shared responsibility does lead to clutter comms and confusing situations. Uh, for an example, the way we do it in OSA, for anybody here that's not OSA, is Mew Mew is our primary shot caller. She'll call the <laughs> she'll yeah. call the pre-fight, the poke phase, and the hard engage. Up until the hard engage, Mew makes most of our calls. Um, I like to talk. Once we get to the mid fight, I will take over, or Bean Bean will make calls as off tank or off support, because we tend to track cooldown usage and positioning of the opposing team while Muse like swinging her hammer and stuff, and being, <laughs> being super threatening. Um, so having that kind of structure and knowledge that. In the mid fight, we're gonna start once we get because how many fights have you lost after getting that first pick? And how frustrating is it? Is, where like all you gotta do is make that extra call out or two, and you you swing that fight. So like that's what we try to avoid by having clean comm structure. Is like avoid those sloppy situations where a little focus would have killed a target. 
Um, so the so yeah, Mew calls up until they engage. Bean and I will call the mid fight, and then the post fight. Um, it'll be like me and Dank and Tinsy. I think tend to be the most vocal post and pre fight. Uh, yeah, Mew as well, but I think like a lot of the strategizing and stuff comes in there, and that's where we have. But that is also where we go off on a lot of tang- tangents. Yeah. So we should strange. work on disciplining ourselves. I mean, I as soon as I start the like engaging in dialogue with you, I'm part of the problem too. So like it's something we have to work on as a team and just be more disciplined about is focus on focusing. <laughs> yeah, I get. It. Um, so shock calling responsibility. Um, can vary, but in general, you want to be shot calling opposing teams pathing your actions, but only those actions that may influence the way your team plays. So, um, as a Reinhardt, letting your team know everything you're doing is absolutely fine because so much of how your team is going to play is dictated by your run play. So, I'm charging, I'm charging. We're committing with the charge, or we're hiding our fuck asses behind some fucking cover, because <laughs> there's I'm no more in that cover. Yeah, so like, <laughs> or like, shields low, shields low. Like, we're going to play differently. So, the a very vocal Reinhardt is a, an integral part of any team. I like talking! Um, <laughs> other than that, Fire. tracking, uh, other things that should be uh, assessed by the shot caller is um, priority. Focus can be a team effort, uh, but priority should definitely be your shot caller's responsibility because it can get sloppy. You can be prioritizing something and then suddenly half your team's prioritizing something else and the fight <sighs> dissolves. Just because somebody made a counter call out. And, like, we've all done it. It all, always happens where you just, like, tunnel vision on that 1v1 you're having. And you're like, wait, no, get this, get this, get this. They're low. Where you should actually be helping your team somewhere else. Um, so, uh, having a designated priority caller and somebody... It, it should usually be the team member with the best game sense. Oh, that's not me. Uh, or the best, like... Uh, awareness, because. That's but how can you determine? Well, no, I, honestly, Bean I feel like does a lot better at that because he has a better angle on stuff. When I'm well, playing Zarya. Well, yeah, yeah, but I'm just saying for our team, like Bean does a lot better of the, um, the mid fight callouts just because of his positioning. Because I'll I'll be super tunnel visioned on Zarya or on Diva a lot of the time because of things I have to assess. Um, okay, I have a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. On, like, priority targeting. So, like, say we all dive in, we're all fighting the Reinhardt, and I notice the Ana like, out of position. As the Brig, is it a bad idea to go after and take out that Ana? By or yourself, yes. focusing on the target? If you're going alone, yes. It's a bad idea. Okay. Um, Ana has a myriad of ways to deal with the Brig. You could get slept, you could get naded, you could get peeled. That Ana is not a guaranteed kill. Or their teams don't realize and peel well, them, and you're dead. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's usually not far away from the fight, so that's what I was like. But Ana even then, example. even like, then, like that's target close by. That's a like solo a queue play. Around. Somebody I can one shot or like. Okay. A tracer's how different. I, a tracer can be one shot. So how do I call that out mid fight? Ana's out of position. Come with me. Like, simple as that. I'm on Ana, I'm on Ana, I'm on Ana. So, question, um, if that is being called out, do we stop the fight with Reinhardt? Um, Reinhardt is tricky. Unless you're running a Zenyatta, prioritizing a Reinhardt at the start of a fight is seldom going to work out. So, we drop our what we're doing and follow... follow. Yeah, ideally, once that mid-fight call-out has been made, once that, like... Hey, the Zarya doesn't have a bubble. Or, hey, the Ana's out of position. Once that's made, 
your front line can stay on the front line, but they should kind of turn to accommodate that call out. So, like, Mew can still shield the front and swing at the front, but the rest of our team should be turning and dealing with that call out. Um, and that's just holding the space. Like, Mew, de- if Mew is the one following that uh, call out, we all have to go. Whereas if it's me and our DPS helping, it's a little easier to just like go there and come back real quick. Um, what's it called? A lot of the time, it's just better to fight with your team. It may not be the best place to fight. It may not be the best target to be fighting. But leaving your team just puts everybody in a bad situation. So Unless you were playing... I mean, yeah, but... You still want to be line of sight as well. Yeah, flanking yeah. flanking can be done well. Flanking can be done poorly. Um, a McKee well, you can for... also focus the same targets, but just from a different angle. So, like... So, there, there's a safe flank, and then there's a hard flank. So, a safe flank in this example is... Um, let's see. You have a Reinhardt right here. That's me. Um, right, right, where? This, this big fucking rectangle. That's me. Rectangle. No, I should have had there. Oh, you what? might, you might have to refresh. I, okay, high. I see, it, I see it now. It's coming in. All right, so you have a Reinhardt there, and your team is fighting from. Uh, your team will be red. Your team's fighting from this angle, like that way. Wait, I'm um, gonna a hard flank in this situation is your McCree or your Reaper or whatever, like something going into this hallway and trying to get on their supports in here. So trying to move all the way in there, that's a hard flank. A safe flank and a, a good flank in this situation is just plopping yourself right here and giving yourself sight lines this way behind the run shield. And still being able to just go back to your team behind cover. Or just hide behind the cover until you can get heals. So, um, hard flanks versus safe flanks. Like, our hard flank is generally from the back of uh, an opposing team. And will take a lot of time and uh, sneakiness to execute. Where a safe flank, you can just walk over there. You take five steps to the left in the middle of a team fight as a Hanzo, as a McCree, as a any as an Ash, as a Widow, anything that suddenly moves over there is a threat. And now if the Ryan doesn't angle his shield that way or that way, um, turn your sensitivity you, up, and then you'll never get hit. There you shake go. Like a Just shake, <laughs> shake it like a Polaroid picture. Hey, yeah, helicopter. Shake it, shake, shake. I'm um, sorry. So yeah, now that. The video isn't loading. And and that in that situation, you kind of wanna as a support. If you're playing on this staircase and you notice a hard or a safe flank being taken, you either need to retreat or call it. So go inside and play safe. Or call Reinhardt, shield that McCree until we deal with him. And ideally, you collapse on that McCree altogether. Like your Reinhardt comes back in, you just rotate that way. Lucio boost on top and take the engagement from the backside. Um, Pathing can completely nullify certain team comps. Um, Say you're dealing with an Orisa Hog setup up here. With like Mercy in the back, Torbjorn here, and they have like an annoying wrecking ball or something that's playing point, and you need to deal with them first. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. A clever way <laughs> to to deal with this, uh, with like not worrying about shit, is just walk around here and go around back, and just walk up on the high ground. You take minimal poke damage and you're walking into their supports from the back. Um, alternatively, 
what I've done, I think we did it in the practice scrim on Numbani, is we just teleport right under the setup with a Symmetra. That was it. Fun. Sounds it sounds silly, but like if they're playing up here, they need to just drop to see you, <laughs> and you get to like chill <laughs> on the point for free. So it works better on stuff like Numbani, but yeah, that that can take teams completely off guard. I think we should start using that Symmetra more. Yeah, we can we can do some clever stuff with it. But we we should bring it out in practice scrims first. Yeah, make for sure, sure it's cleaned up. Bring it out. And Although quickly. we we did that shit in our first scrim on Hanamura, that was clean. <laughs> That's awesome. Um. Oh yeah, I watched that. Let's see. So, what else? Uh, shot calling, comp structure. What else about comp structure should we go over? Uh, okay. Knowing what's an important call out and what isn't. That's a good one. Uh, what you? What were you gonna say, Sheeps? Um, no, it's okay. I answer this. Question. All right. So, good information versus bad information. Letting your team know about a threat is really good. Giving your team extra information about the threat can clutter the comms. Um, the same way, like. If you're a Reinhardt shielding a choke, for example, and all you're just saying over comms is, I'm shielding choke, I'm shielding choke, I'm shielding choke, I'm shielding choke, you're not giving all that much information to your team. You're just kind of letting your team know what you're doing. What you can do is, I'm shielding choke, move forward, their Reins low, their shield's half, their shield's a quarter. So, like... Uh, Cleaning up your communication and at the same time uh, including more valuable information are what like makes a difference between good comms and bad comms. Because uh, bad comms, you could have really talkative teammates, but very little good information being passed around. Whereas you could have Niwu saying two or three things per game. But they're so valuable that they swing team fights. So, like that, that there can be that much discrepancy in how you make call out. So, like me, for example, I mid fight, I don't really say that much. I try to focus on my mechanics. I try to play like in the moment. I'm I'm not talking as much usually. Um, I've been forcing myself to more lately, but that's beside the point. Um. When I do make callouts, though, it's precise, effective, important stuff. So, for example, if I haven't talked for the first seven seconds of a team fight, and you hear from me that there is a threat on the flank, it's probably super important. Because I'm focusing on sharing the most important information I can, and not oversharing to the point where we we can't make that call out because the comms are full already so i it's not a problem i've seen with our team much uh like start start a fight to mid fight our comms are super clean it's like late fight to uh post fight pre fight is where we kind of get sloppy um but we can all definitely work on just discerning what is good information and what is bad information <laughs> Agreed. I think we kind of struggle more when we're losing fights um, on comms because it's like start losing our main shot callers, then nobody's shot calling, so somebody calls out for somebody to shot call, and then everybody starts shot calling with their shot call things. Like so that's kind of that uh, that doesn't happen when we're losing as much as when people start dying. Well, so that's, like, that's what I meant, like losing the fights. So like. But we could be even. Sure we could not. be. It could be a four v four situation. But Mew and I have died, and at that point, I'm on the mic being like, "Call focus," because I'm not there, and I don't want to add that in info of like I'm not there because it's not that important. You guys saw me die. You saw the kill feed, like so. I'm just like, "Call focus," and in that situation, you're right. Like it does become frank, frantic, and like disorganized, where like everybody's trying to find something to call. Where, like, there's no valuable information being passed. It's just like, fuck, I'm on this, I guess. Um, 
what we can do in those situations i mean like for one we haven't really done many soft resets as a team that's a concept like i want to start implementing in our practices and stuff more for sure is just like mid fight soft reset real quick got cooldowns all right let's pick a target go back in um during a soft reset allowing yourself to like decide a target like giving your time to decide that target can be super valuable as well um but so for example say we're pushing uh two cp we're on second point of anubis M mew kills a reinhardt by charging in i follow her up i bubble her she dies uh, I kill their Zarya, but then I die. We're like, hey, this is still winnable, but we're not there to call the focus. It's up to you guys. So we'll probably have like D.Va and the three supports, or D.Va and two supports and a DPS. So at that point, either our D.Va player or our Zenyatta or Lucia player or off support player, so Bean, one of them have to take on shot calling responsibilities at that point. <coughs> and that's where it gets tricky is when your shot caller dies in a fight they're not there anymore they can only do so much from spectator camp so you kind of want somebody in the fight making those okay, calls so next question is it a bad thing to have your shot caller like place that onto somebody after he dies like just real quick say you die and you see Mew in the fight you're like Mew shot call um Yes and no, because it can be super situational. If Mew's in a bad place, but we have tons of heals coming our way, it's Bean's responsibility. It's our main healer's responsibility to be like, hey, you're good. We got you. Keep fighting. Um, and now well, it's, or not like, like I, just Mew, but like if you want to throw it on somebody else, like say, dang, call or... Well, th the thing is like... When we're in those situations where we don't have a shot caller actively involved in the fight, we need to have either a... Or no, we need to have an off support alive. Otherwise, we don't have the utility needed to win the fight. Gotcha. So that'll be where we call for a, re <laughs> a hard reset or like, hey, we can continue this fight. Keep going. So like if, if Niwu is on Zen, for example... And he's like, I got discords here. I got fucking, I'm popping off and popping people's domes. You can take a 4v4 and win that shit easy, even if it's not an ideal 4v4. Yeah. So, like, those are those split-second uh, decisions that have to be made based on the ever-changing conditions that are presented to us. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you also hear me? I hear, they all seem to be cutting out in and out for me. Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Uh, did y'all? I did step away for, for a second. Um, did you ever cover? Was it proactive and reactive? Uh, calling. No, no we didn't. not yet. That's a good one. That's good. Right. Um, I like when you step away because you think of things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Leave and come back again. Um. So yeah, proactive callouts versus reactive callouts. You should never be in a position where you're making reactive callouts. And if you do, make sure they are as quick as possible. Um, a proactive callout is something that will prevent something bad from happening. Or like, that's too abstract. Um, let's, let's go into specifics here. Like a proactive callout on a flanker, for example. Say, sheeps, I'm going to pick on you. Uh, say you're... <laughs> say sheeps is playing. Say sheeps is playing McCree right here, in it's the courtyard. <laughs> I can't see the video. I'm sorry. You you Why? can watch it's the YouTube. You can watch the YouTube video later. Um, no. say sheeps is playing in the courtyard, and we're playing on point behind uh Muse barrier right here. Um, <laughs> sheeps plays. Uh, so sheeps takes a one v one out here against a flanker that ends up uh, concluding over here, like in the back. Go, sheeps, go. If Sheeps doesn't call the 1v1 as it starts, she gets no resources from point. She gets no help from the tanks. No heals, no nothing, no discord on Genji jumping oh, on her, yeah. whatever. Um, 
And then if at the end the Genji wins the 1v1 God and man, Cheeps. and Cheeps is like fuck. fuck and then <laughs> and then after saying fuck, finally he's like, "Oh shit, guys." And then says, "Hey, there's a Genji on your back left." By that Ratchet time, me. by that time, <laughs> that Genji might have already killed your supports. God damn it, Sheeps, we were counting on you. So that's an example <laughs> that's an example of reactive comms hurting a team. <laughs> the other side of that is if we're playing a McCree on this map, uh we're probably playing like McCree goats. So Sheeps calls uh Genji on me in courtyard. Proactively. Uh suddenly armor pack hits the McCree. You're fucking hard to kill McCree. Discord orb hits the Genji. Suddenly he's easier to kill. I fly over with Diva or start chucking bombs with Zarya, some shit. Extra damage coming. So like that's just an example, but that's where proactive callouts and calling things in advance before they happen or as they're about to happen can help you versus like, oh shit, this happened. Let me call it. Uh I see it happening a lot with like lower level support players. Especially, you'll you'll have a flanker kill them, and then you'll hear after they're dead, they'll be like, fuck, there was a Genji behind you, by the way. Like, let me know five seconds earlier, I'll turn around and bubble you. I'll try to fight off that Genji and at least scare him off so he doesn't kill you. But, like, um, proactive comms can be a band-aid for a lot of problems that never would have occurred in the first place. If, if, like, somebody had said something. So, um, perfect example. Say you have a teammate that's not on mic. Um, somebody that just doesn't talk a lot. They see a Reaper on the high ground behind you guys. They don't say anything. Y'all know what happens from here. So, like, that's... Yeah, those are really basic examples, but that's just, that just goes to show, like, how proactive comms can hurt, can help you versus reactive comms being like, oh shit, yeah, the Reaper was behind us. Um, what's another example? Uh, you get, can you guys think if, of anything? What if they jump you? Uh, you have to be very, very quick about saying, Genji on me, Genji on me, help, 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 help. And call it until it happens if it's a, if it's a threat. Yeah, because saying something once, Help! saying something once over comms isn't nearly as urgent as. Re oh, that's a very that brings us to a very very important point. So, focus targets versus positional targets. Uh, focus callouts versus positional callouts. So, um, if somebody says Genji on me in the back only once, and doesn't keep saying it. I'm not going to think that Genji's a big threat. I think that Genji's just like chilling near the back and spamming shurikens in. If my support on the other hand says, Genji on me, Genji on me, Genji on me, help, 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 help. I understand the urgency. I understand like, hey, they need immediate help. I need to peel right now. So even without saying peel, you can like get <clears throat> peel from your team. Uh, even if your teammates don't like, understand the concept of peel so like say you're playing support in a comp game on the ladder you can still get teammates to peel even if they don't understand that they're peeling you can just be like help me help me help me and they'll fly back and help you start screaming sporadically and it will help so um <clears throat> i'm dying going back to what sheeps was saying is like what if they just dive you hopefully if they just dive you you're not here you over here? So, like, if they dive you and you're out of position, you're dead. The, they took advantage of your bad positioning. There was nothing we could do. Uh, if, you find your, if you find that happening a lot, where you're being dove on and your team can't help you, start looking at your positioning on a game-to-game -game basis. Like, take VODs, be like, where was I? Why did that happen? Um, but ideally... If they dive on you, you're close enough to your teammates that that call for help is more than enough for them to devote resources to you and keep you up through whatever dive. Um, so going back to positional 
uh, callouts versus focus callouts. If somebody says Genji on the side here, I'm not chasing that Genji on the side. That's just m me being aware. Okay, there's a Genji there. Versus Genji, 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 Genji. We're going on that Genji. So if as a teammate you're trying to make your team follow focus, don't just say it once. You got to be like, keep saying that thing till it's dead. Reinhardt, 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 Reinhardt. Keep chasing that Reinhardt till he's fucking down. Um, or if a Tracer's flanking, Tracer going left side. Say it once. Your team knows now. Everybody can deal with her when she approaches from that left side. Uh, and call those proactive positional callouts can actually help uh, your teammates peel. Because they'll know what direction the threat's coming from. Um, what's it called? So, going back to positional callouts. If we're walking into a Numbani or a Horizon. Or some point that's got lots of high ground. A lot of the time we'll be like, hey, there's a soldier up there. Or hey, there's something up there. Like, there's a threat we should be aware of. But I'll see our teammates chasing that threat. I wasn't making that call out as a means of focus, but suddenly it's turned into that because they took my awareness call out as a focus call out. And that's where a lot of disconnect can come in is like, you said soldier was up here. I was going on the soldier. When in reality, I was just like, just watch out for the soldier while we play on point. So it's a lot to try to differentiate in the middle of a game and it's easier to register if you convey your urgency through the amount or like you can obviously convey urgency through your tone but in the moment sometimes it's just easier to repeat yourself and just be like diva 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 or like whatever focus target um i try because i know it can be confusing just hearing like something and not it not being focus target Whenever that uh, there's a threat up top, I'll just be like, watch out at the end of my sentence. So like, soldier on top right, watch out. So that people will know like, we're not going on it, but it's something to watch out for. But we should aspire to be at a point in our comms where we don't have to add that extra information. <laughs> it's just like, all right, that's an awareness call out. Um, kind of something I want to throw in there. Um, good. With uh, callouts, try not to make them too long, too. So, like, if you're calling a Ryan, and obviously don't call Ryan Hart. Mostly everyone calls him, like, Ryan, Ryan, like, Ryan. Yeah. Like, the less it words, the better. Helps think, yeah, it just helps a uh, comm stay a little more clear and everything to be a little more understandable. It's why it's called Walls and not Infosite. It's why it's called Blade and not Dragon Blade. It's so it's called grab and not graviton surge. It's a lot easier to convey things when you Daddy use. Daddy shaddy. <laughs> no, but like calling it slam versus saying earth shatter that cleans up comms so much. It's a small thing, but like you're turning a three syllable word into one syllable, and that cleans up comms a shitload. Like if you say dragons, like you all automatically know it's dragons. Yeah, like you don't have to say Dragon Strike, you just say Dragons. You... Um, what if I have the wolf skin on? Yeah. Wolves! Hi. The furries are coming! Hi. Don't say wolves, I swear to God, I'll be the most confused motherfucker on that field. <laughs> the wolves are coming! The wolves how do, are I, coming. How do I kick somebody out of a voice channel? <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, kind of want to get a little feedback for someone, uh, from someone. I'm kind of stuck on what the fuck they call hamster. Like I call him hamster, ball. Yeah, I guess ball, ball right? Ball, ball uh, is the ideal call out. That's another thing I was gonna say too. Like, that's a good thing to call him. Yeah, ball, 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 ball. But that kind of gets confused with junk rat. No, no, don't call him rat. Rat, no. Junk? Rat. It's just a junk. I, call junk. Junk. I always call him junk. But now it's just penny. There's a penny. <laughs> just penny. Oh my it's gosh, penny. toxic. <laughs> We're recording this, sheeps. Oh no! Do that. Oh no! It's not in the Discord. Bleep it out. Um. <laughs> anyways, what else should we go over? I feel like that kind of tackled a lot of it. Yeah. Okay. Now we're gonna watch the rest of the video.
No, now we can play some quick play and start implementing strategies for the rest of the time yeah. we got left. Oh, we're yeah, playing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Niwoo. Uh, <laughs> Niwoo's like, Niwoo we get to here. play. Niwoo. Yo, what's up? How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Niwoo, wake up. Yeah. Yeah.